Chapter 15, Part 1 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Carafit. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 15 The Peace of Righteousness. Part 1 there can be no nobler cause for which to work than the peace of righteousness and high honor is due those serene and lofty souls who with wisdom and courage with high idealism tempered by sane facing of the actual facts of life have striven to bring nearer the day when armed strife between nation and nation between class and class between man and man shall end throughout the world because all this is true, it is also true that there are no men more ignoble or more foolish, no men whose actions are fraught with greater possibility of mischief to their country and to mankind than those who exalt unrighteous peace as better than righteous war. The men who have stood highest in our history, as in the history of all countries, are those who scorned injustice, who were incapable of oppressing the weak or of permitting their country with their consent to oppress the weak, but who did not hesitate to draw the sword when to leave it undrawn meant inability to arrest triumphant wrong. All this is so obvious that it ought not be necessary to repeat it. Yet every man in active affairs who also reads about the past grows by bitter experience to realize that there are plenty of men, not only among those who mean ill, but among those who mean well, who are ready enough to praise what was done in the past, and yet are incapable of profiting by it when faced by the needs of the present. During our generations, this seems to have been peculiarly the case among the men who have become obsessed with the idea of obtaining universal peace by some cheap patent panacea. There has been a real and substantial growth and the feeling for international responsibility and justice among the great civilized nations during the past threescore or fourscore years. There has been a real growth of recognition of the fact that moral turpitude is involved in the wrong-going of one nation by another, and that in most cases war is an evil method of settling international difficulties. But as yet, there has been only a rudimentary beginning of the development of international tribunals of justice, and there has been no development at all of any international police power. Now, as I have already said, the whole fabric of municipal law, of law within each nation, rests ultimately upon the judge and the policeman, and the complete absence of the policeman, and the most complete absence of the judge in international affairs, prevents there being as yet any real homology between municipal and international law. Moreover, the questions which sometimes involve nations in war are far more difficult and complex than any questions that affect merely individuals. Almost every great nation has inherited certain questions, either with other nations or with sections of its own people, which it is quite impossible, in the present state of civilization, to decide as matters between private individuals can be decided. During the last century, at least half of the wars that have been fought have been civil and not foreign wars. There are big and powerful nations which habitually commit, either upon other nations or upon sections of their own people, wrongs so outrageous as to justify even the most peaceful persons in going to war. There are also weak nations so utterly incompetent either to protect the rights of foreigners against their own citizens, or to protect their own citizens against foreigners, that it becomes a matter of sheer duty for some outside power to interfere in connection with them. As yet, in neither case is there any efficient method of getting international action, and if joint action by several powers is secured, the result is usually considerably worse than if only one power interfered. The worst infamies of modern times, such affairs as the massacres of the Armenians by the Turks, for instance, 
have been perpetuated in a time of nominally profound international peace, when there has been a concert of big powers to prevent the breaking of this peace, although only by breaking it could the outrages be stopped. Be it remembered that the peoples who suffered by these hideous massacres, who saw their women violated and their children tortured, were actually enjoying the benefits of, quote, disarmament, unquote. Otherwise, they would not have been massacred. For if the Jews in Russia and the Armenians in Turkey had been armed and had been efficient in the use of their arms, no mob would have meddled with them. Yet amiable but fatuous persons, with all these facts before their eyes, pass resolutions demanding universal arbitration for everything, and the disarmament of free civilized powers and their abandonment of their armed forces, or else they write well-meaning, solemn little books, or pamphlets or editorials, and articles in magazines or newspapers, to show that it is, quote, an illusion, unquote, to believe that war ever pays, because it is expensive. This is precisely like arguing that we should disband the police, and devote our sole attention to pursuing criminals, that it is, quote, an illusion, unquote, to suppose that burglary, highway robbery, and white slavery are profitable. It is almost useless to attempt to argue with these well-intentioned persons, because they are suffering under an obsession and are not open to reason. They go wrong at the outset, for they lay all the emphasis on peace and none at all on righteousness. They are not all of them physically timid men, but they are usually men of soft life, and they rarely possess a high sense of honor or keen patriotism. They rarely try to prevent their fellow countrymen from insulting or wronging the people of other nations. But they always ardently advocate that we in our turn shall tamely submit to wrong and insult from other nations. As Americans, their folly is peculiarly scandalous, because if the principles they now uphold are right, it means that it would have been better that Americans should never have achieved their independence, and better that, in 1861, they should have peacefully submitted to seeing their country split into half a dozen jangling confederacies and slavery made perpetual. If unwilling to learn from their own history, let those who think that it is, quote, an illusion, unquote, to believe that a war never benefits a nation, look at the difference between China and Japan. China has neither a fleet nor an efficient army. It is a huge civilized empire, one of the most populous on the globe, and it has been the helpless prey of outsiders because it does not possess the power to fight. Japan stands on a footing of equality with European and American nations because it does possess this power. China now sees Japan, Russia, Germany, England, and France in possession of fragments of her empire, and has twice within the lifetime of the present generation seen her capital in the hands of allied invaders, because she, in very fact, realizes the ideals of the persons who wish the United States to disarm, and then trust that our helplessness will secure us a contemptuous immunity from attack by outside nations. The chief trouble comes from the entire inability of these worthy people to understand that they are demanding things that are mutually incompatible when they demand peace at any price and also justice and righteousness. I remember one representative of their number who used to write little sonnets on behalf of the Mahdi and the Sudanese, these sonnets setting forth the need that the Sudan should be both independent and peaceful. As a matter of fact, the Sudan valued independence only because it desired to war against all Christians and to carry out an unlimited slave trade. It was, quote, independent, unquote, under the Mahdi for a dozen years, and during those dozen years, the bigotry, tyranny, and cruel religious intolerance were such as flourished in the 7th century, and in spite of systematic slave raids, the population decreased by nearly two-thirds, and practically all the children died. Peace came, well-being came, freedom from rape and murder and torture and highway robbery and every brutal gratification of lust and greed came, 
only when the Sudan lost its independence and passed under English rule. Yet, this well-meaning little sonneteer sincerely felt that his verses were issued in the cause of humanity. Looking back from the vantage point of a score of years, probably everyone will agree that he was an absurd person. But he was not one whit more absurd than most of the more prominent persons who advocate disarmament by the United States, the cessation of upbuilding the Navy, and the promise to agree to arbitrate all matters, including those affecting our national interests and honor with all foreign nations. These persons would do no harm if they affected only themselves. Many of them are, in the ordinary relations of life, good citizens. They are exactly like the other good citizens who believe that enforced universal vegetarianism or anti-vaccination is the panacea for all ills. But in their particular case, they are able to do harm because they affect our relations with foreign powers, so that other men pay the debt which they themselves have really incurred. It is the foolish peace at any price persons who try to persuade our people to make unwise and improper treaties or to stop building up the navy. But if trouble comes and the treaties are repudiated or there is a demand for armed intervention, it is not these people who will pay anything. They will stay at home in safety and leave brave men to pay in blood and honest men to pay in shame for their folly. The trouble is that our policy is apt to go in zigzags because different sections of our people exercise at different times unequal pressure on our government. One class of our citizens clamors for treaties impossible of fulfillment and improper to fulfill. Another class has no objection to the passage of these treaties so long as there is no concrete case to which they apply, but instantly oppose a veto on their application when any concrete case does actually arise. One of our cardinal doctrines is freedom of speech, which means freedom of speech about foreigners as well as about ourselves. And insomuch as we exercise this right, with complete absence of restraint, we cannot expect other nations to hold us harmless unless in the last resort we are able to make our own words good by our deeds. One class of our citizens indulges in gushing promises to do everything for foreigners. Another class offensively and improperly reviles them. And it is hard to say which class more thoroughly misrepresents the sober, self-respecting judgment of the American people as a whole. The only safe rule is to promise little, and faithfully to keep every promise, to speak softly, and carry a big stick. A prime need for our nation, as of course for every other nation, is to make up its mind definitely what it wishes, and not to try to pursue paths of conduct incompatible with the other. If this nation is content to be the China of the New World, then and only then can it afford to do away with the Navy and the Army. If it is content to abandon Hawaii and the Panama Canal, to cease to talk of the Monroe Doctrine, and to admit the right of any European or Asiatic power to dictate what immigrants shall be sent to and received in America, and whether or not they shall be allowed to become citizens and hold land, why, of course, if America is content to have nothing to say on any of these matters and to keep silent in the presence of armed outsiders, then it can abandon its navy and agree to arbitrate all questions of all kinds with every foreign power. In such event, it can afford to pass its spare time in one continuous round of universal peace celebrations and of smug self-satisfaction in having earned the derision of all the virile peoples of mankind. Those who advocate such a policy do not occupy a lofty position, but at least their position is understandable. It is entirely inexcusable, however, to try to combine the unready hand with the unbridled tongue. 
It is folly to permit freedom of speech about foreigners as well as ourselves, and the peace at any price persons are much too feeble a folk to try to interfere with freedom of speech, and yet try to shirk the consequences of freedom of speech. It is folly to try to abolish our navy, and at the same time to insist that we have a right to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, that we have the right to control the Panama Canal, which we ourselves dug, that we have a right to retain Hawaii and prevent nations from taking Cuba, and a right to determine what immigrants, Asiatic or European, shall come to our shores, and the terms on which they shall be naturalized and shall hold land and exercise other privileges. We are a rich people, and an unmilitary people. In international affairs, we are a short-sighted people. But I know, my countrymen, down at bottom, their temper is such that they will not permanently tolerate injustice done to them. In the long run, they will no more permit affronts to their national honor than injuries to their national interests. Such being the case, they will do well to remember that the surest of all ways to invite disaster is to be opulent, aggressive, and unarmed. Throughout the seven and a half years that I was president, I pursued without faltering one consistent foreign policy, a policy of genuine international goodwill and of consideration for the rights of others, and at the same time of steady preparedness. The weakest nations knew that they, no less than the strongest, were safe from insolent and injury at our hands, and the strong and the weak alike also knew that we possessed both the will and the ability to guard ourselves from wrong or insult at the hands of any one. It was under my administration that the Hague Court was saved from becoming an empty farce. It had been established by joint international agreement but no power had been willing to resort to it. Those establishing it had grown to realize that it was in danger of becoming a mere paper court, so that it would never really come into being at all. Monsieur de Estronales de Constant had been especially alive to this danger. By correspondence and in personal interviews, he impressed upon me the need not only of making advances by actually applying arbitration, not merely promising by treaty to apply it, to the questions that were up for settlement, but of using the Hague Tribunal for this purpose. I cordially sympathized with these views. On the recommendation of John Hay, I succeeded in getting an agreement with Mexico to lay a matter in dispute between the two republics before the Hague Court. This was the first case ever brought before the Hague Court. It was followed by numerous others, and it definitely established that court as the great international peace tribunal. By mutual agreement with Great Britain, through the decision of a joint commission, of which the American members were Senators Lodge and Turner and Secretary Root, we were able peacefully to settle the Alaska boundary question, the only question remaining between ourselves and the British Empire, which it was not possible to settle by friendly arbitration. This, therefore, represented the removal of the last obstacle to absolute agreement between the two peoples. We were of substantial service in bringing to a satisfactory conclusion the negotiations at Algeciras concerning Morocco. We concluded with Great Britain, and with most of the other great nations, arbitration treaties specifically agreeing to arbitrate all matters and especially the interpretation of treaties, save only as regards questions affecting territorial integrity, national honor, and vital national interests. We made with Great Britain a treaty guaranteeing the free use of the Panama Canal on equal terms with the ships of all nations, while reserving to ourselves the right to police and fortify the canal, and therefore to control it in the time of war. Under this treaty, we are in honor bound to arbitrate the question of canal tolls for coastwise traffic between the western and eastern coasts of the United States. I believe that the American position as regards this matter is right. I also believe that under the arbitration treaty, we are in honor bound to submit the matter to arbitration in view of Great Britain's contention, 
although I hold it to be an unwise contention that our position is unsound. I empathetically disbelieve in making universal arbitration treaties which neither the makers nor anyone else would for a moment dream of keeping. I no less emphatically insist that it is our duty to keep the limited and sensible arbitration treaties which we have already made. The importance of a promise lies not in making it, but in keeping it. And the poorest of all positions for a nation to occupy in such a matter is readiness to make impossible promises at the same time that there is a failure to keep promises which have been made, which can be kept, and which it is discreditable to break. During the early part of the year 1905, the strain on the civilized world caused by the Russo-Japanese War became serious. The losses of life and of treasure were frightful. From all the sources of information at hand, I grew most strongly to believe that a further continuation of the struggle would be a very bad thing for Japan, and an even worse thing for Russia. Japan was already suffering terribly from the drain upon her men, and especially upon her resources, and had nothing further to gain from the continuance of the struggle. Its continuance to her meant more loss than gain, even if she were victorious. Russia, in spite of her gigantic strength, was, in my judgment, apt to lose even more than she had already lost, if the struggle continued. I deemed it probable that she would no more be able successfully to defend eastern Siberia and northern Manchuria than she had been able to defend southern Manchuria and Korea. If the war went on, I thought it on the whole, likely that Russia would be driven west of Lake Baikal. But it was very far from certain. There is no certainty in such a war. Japan might have met defeat, and defeat to her would have spelt overwhelming disaster. And even if she had continued to win, what she thus won would have been of no value to her, and the cost in blood and money would have left her drained white. I believed, therefore, that the time had come when it was greatly to the interest of both combatants to have peace, and when, therefore, it was possible to get both to agree to peace. I first satisfied myself that each side wished me to act, but that, naturally and properly, each side was exceedingly anxious that the other should not believe that the action was taken on its initiative. I then sent an identical note to the two powers proposing that they should meet through their representatives to see if peace could not be made directly between them, and offered to act as an intermediary in bringing about such a meeting, but not for any other purpose. Each ascended to my proposal in principle. There was difficulty in getting them to agree on a common meeting place, but each finally abandoned its original contention in the matter, and the representatives of the two nations finally met at Portsmouth in New Hampshire. I previously received the two delegations at Oyster Bay on the USS Mayflower, which together with another naval vessel I put at their disposal on behalf of the United States government to take them from Oyster Bay to Portsmouth. As is customary, but both unwise and undesirable in such cases, each side advanced claims that the other could not grant. The chief difficulty came because of Japan's demand for a money indemnity. I felt that it would be better for Russia to pay some indemnity than to go on with the war, for there was little chance, in my judgment, of the war turning out favorably for Russia and the revolutionary movement already under way bade fair to overthrow the negotiations entirely. I advised the Russian government to this effect, at the same time urging them to abandon their pretensions on certain other points, notably concerning the southern half of the Segalian which the Japanese had taken. I also, however, and equally strongly, advised the Japanese that in my judgment it would have been the gravest mistake on their part to insist on continuing the war for the sake of a money indemnity. And the longer the war continued, the less able she would be to pay. I pointed out that there was no possible analogy between their case and that of Germany in the war with France, which they were fond of quoting. The Germans held Paris and half of France, and gave up much territory in lieu of the indemnity, 
whereas the Japanese were still many thousands of miles from Moscow and had no territory whatever which they wished to give up. I also pointed out that in my judgment, whereas the Japanese had enjoyed the sympathy of most of the civilized powers at the outset of and during the continuance of the war, they would forfeit it if they turned the war into one merely for getting money, and moreover, they would most certainly fail to get the money, and would simply find themselves at the end of a year, even if things prospered with them, in possession of territory they did not want, having spent enormous additional sums of money, and lost enormous additional numbers of men, and yet without a penny of remuneration. The Treaty of Peace was finally signed. As is inevitable under such circumstances, each side felt that it ought to have got better terms. And when the danger was well past, each side felt that it had been overreached by the other, and that if the war had gone on it would have gotten more than it actually did get. The Japanese government had been wise throughout, except in the matter of announcing that it would insist on a money indemnity. Neither in national nor in private affairs is it ordinarily advisable to make a bluff which cannot be put through personally. I never believe in doing it under any circumstances. The Japanese people had been misled by this bluff of their government, and the unwisdom of the government's action in the matter was shown by the great resentment the treaty aroused in Japan. Although it was so beneficial to Japan, there were various mob outbreaks, especially in the Japanese cities. The police were roughly handled, and several Christian churches were burned, as reported to me by the American minister. In both Russia and Japan, I believe that the net result, as regards myself, was a feeling of injury, and of dislike of me among the people at large. I had expected this. I regarded it as entirely neutral, and I did not resent it in the least. The governments of both nations behaved towards me not only with correct and entire propriety, but with much courtesy and the fullest acknowledgment of the good effect of what I had done. And in Japan, at least, I believe that the leading men sincerely felt I had been their friend. I had certainly tried my best to be the friend not only of the Japanese people, but of the Russian people, and I believe that what I did was for the best interests of both and of the world at large. During the course of the negotiations, I tried to enlist the aid of the governments of one nation which was friendly to Russia, and of another nation which was friendly to Japan, and helping to bring about peace. I got no aid from either. I did, however, receive aid from the Emperor of Germany. His ambassador at St. Petersburg was the one ambassador who helped the American ambassador, Mr. Meyer, at delicate and doubtful points of the negotiations. Mr. Meyer, who was with the exception of Mr. White, the most useful diplomat in the American service, rendered literally invaluable aid by insisting upon himself seeing the Tsar at critical periods of the transaction, when it was no longer possible for me to act successfully through the representatives of the Tsar, who were often at cross-purposes with one another. As a result of the Portsmouth Peace, I was given the Nobel Peace Prize. This consisted of a medal, which I kept, and a sum of forty thousand dollars, which I turned over as a foundation of industrial peace to a board of trustees which included Oscar Strauss, Seth Lowe, and John Mitchell. In the present state of the world's development, industrial peace is even more essential than international peace, and it was fitting and appropriate to devote the Peace Prize to such a purpose. In 1910, while in Europe, one of my most pleasant experiences was my visit to Norway, where I addressed the Nobel Committee, and set forth in full the principles upon which I had acted, not only in this particular case, but throughout my administration. I received another gift which I deeply appreciated, an original copy of Sully's Memoirs of Henry Le Grand, sent me with the following inscription. I translated roughly. Paris, 
January 1906. The undersigned members of the French Parliamentary Group of International Arbitration and Consolation have decided to tender President Roosevelt a token of their high esteem and their sympathetic recognition of the persistent and decisive initiative he has taken towards gradually substituting friendly and judicial for violent methods in case of conflict between nations. They believe that the action of President Roosevelt, which has realized the most generous hopes to be found in history, should be classified as a continuance of similar illustrious attempts of former times, notably the project for international concord known under the name of the great design of Henry IV and the memoirs of his prime minister, the Duc de Sully. In consequence, they have sought out a copy of the first edition of these memoirs, and they take pleasure in offering it to him with the request that he will keep it among his family papers. The signatures include those of Emily Loubet, A. Carnot, D. Estronales, D. Constant, Astride Briand, Sully Prodhom, Jan Yores, A. Falires, R. Poincare, and two or three hundred others. Of course, what I had done in connection with the Portsmouth piece was misunderstood by some good and sincere people, just as after the settlement of the coal strike there were persons who thereupon thought that it was in my power and was in my duty to settle all other strikes. So after the peace of Portsmouth there were other persons, not only Americans, by the way, who thought it my duty forwith to make myself a kind of international meddlesome matty, and interfere for peace and justice promiscuously over the world. Others, with a delightful non sequitur, jumped to the conclusion that insomuch as I had helped to bring about a beneficent and necessary peace, I must of necessity have changed my mind about war being ever necessary. A couple of days after peace was concluded, I wrote to a friend, quote, Don't you be misled by the fact that just at the moment men are speaking well of me. They will speak ill soon enough. As Loeb remarked to me today, sometime soon I shall have to spank some little international brigand, and then all the well-meaning idiots will turn and shriek that this is inconsistent with what I did at the peace conference whereas in reality it will be exactly in line with it." End quote. To one of my political opponents, Mr. Schertz, who wrote me congratulating me upon the outcome at Portsmouth and suggesting that the time was opportune for a move towards disarmament, I answered in a letter setting forth views which I thought sound then and think sound now. The letter read as follows. Oyster Bay, New York, September 8, 1905. My dear Mr. Schertz, I thank you for your congratulations. As to what you say about disarmament, which I suppose is the rough equivalent of, quote, the gradual diminution of the oppressive burdens opposed upon the world by armed peace, unquote, I am not clear either as to what can be done or what ought to be done. If I had been known as one of the conventional type of peace advocates, I could have done nothing whatever in bringing about peace now. I would be powerless in the future to accomplish anything, and I would not have been able to help counter the boons upon Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Panama brought about by our action therein. If the Japanese had not armed during the last 20 years, this would indeed be a sorrowful century for Japan. If this country had not fought the Spanish War, if we had failed to take the action we did about Panama, all mankind would have been the loser. While the Turks were butchering the Armenians, the European powers kept the peace, and thereby added a burden of infamy to the 19th century, for in keeping that peace, a greater number of lives were lost than in any European war since the days of Napoleon. And these lives were those of women and children as well as of men. 
while the moral degradation, the brutality inflicted and endured, the aggregate of hideous wrong done, surpassed that of any war which we have record in modern times. Until people get it firmly fixed in their minds that peace is valuable chiefly as a means to righteousness, and that it can only be considered as an end when it also coincides with righteousness, we can do only a limited amount to advance its coming on this earth. There is, of course, no analogy at present between international law and private or municipal law, because there is no sanction of force for the former, while there is for the latter. Inside our own nation, the law-abiding man does not have to arm himself against the lawless, simply because there is some armed force, the police, the sheriff's posse, the National Guard, the regulars, which can be called out to enforce the laws. At present, there is no similar international force to call on, and I do not as yet see how it could at present be created. Hitherto, peace has often come only because some strong and on the whole just power has by armed force or the threat of armed force put a stop to disorder. In a very interesting French book the other day, I was reading how the Mediterranean was freed from pirates only by the Pax Britannica, established by England's naval force. The hopeless and hideous bloodshed and wickedness of Algiers and Turkestan was stopped, and could only be stopped when civilized nations in the shape of Russia and France took possession of them. The same was true of Burma and the Malay states, as well as Egypt. With regard to England, peace has come only as the sequel to armed interference of a civilized power, which relatively to its opponent was a just and beneficent power. If England had disarmed to the point of being unable to conquer the Sudan and protect Egypt, so that the Matists had established their supremacy in northeastern Africa, the result would have been a horrible and bloody calamity to mankind. It was only the growth of the European powers and military efficiency that freed Eastern Europe from the dreadful scourge of the Tartar and partially freed it from the dreadful scourge of the Turk. Unjust war is dreadful. A just war may be the highest duty. To have the best nations, the free and civilized nations, disarm and leave the despotisms and barbarisms with great military force would be a calamity compared to which the calamities caused by all the wars of the 19th century would be trivial. Yet, it is not easy to see how we can, by international agreement, state exactly which power ceases to be free and civilized and which comes near the line of barbarism or despotism. For example, I suppose it would be very difficult to get Russia and Japan to come to a common agreement on this point, and there are at least some citizens of other nations, not to speak of their governments, whom it would also be hard to get together. This does not in the least mean that it is hopeless to make the effort. It may be that some scheme will be developed. America, fortunately, can cordially assist in such an effort, for no one in his senses would suggest our disarmament. And though we should continue to perfect our small navy and our minute army, I do not think it necessary to increase the number of our ships at any rate as things look now, nor the number of our soldiers. Of course our navy must be kept up to the highest point of efficiency, and the replacing of old and worthless vessels by first-class new ones may involve an increase in the personnel, but not enough to interfere with our action along the lines you have suggested. But before I would know how to advocate such action, save in some such way as commending it to the attention of the Hague Tribunal, I would have to have a feasible and rational plan of action presented. It seems to me that a general stop in the increase of the war navies of the world might be a good thing, but I would not like to speak too positively offhand. 
Of course, it is only in continental Europe that the armies are too large, and before advocating action as regards them, I should have to weigh matters carefully, including, by the way, such a matter as the Turkish army. At any rate, nothing useful can be done unless with the clear recognition that we object to putting peace second to righteousness. Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Honorable Carl Schertz, Bolton Landing, Lake George, New York. End of chapter 15, part 1. Recording by Stephen Carafit in Montezuma, Ohio. www.carafitfarms.com <laughs>